You know, in the world we live in, sometimes it's tough. When you look at the news, it seems as if our world has gone mad. Someone has killed someone here, and someone has shot someone there. Atrocious acts of violence are happening all across our world. Abortion is still legal. Marriage is being changed. Our world doesn't look at things the way we look at them. When you drive through the community that we live in, you can see the effects of sin. You can sit and see it written on even some names of some buildings. We have to realize this morning, sin exists. If you get nothing out of this morning, get this. Sin exists. And the goal of sin is to take you away from eternity in heaven. That's its thrust, that's its means, that's its message. To separate you away from God. We sit here this morning and we sing these songs of praise. We pray these prayers. We partake of the Lord's Supper. We give our means as children of God. As different people from the world. We don't live like the world. We, we don't live in the, of the world. We may live in the world as in we live by the world. We don't live of the world. But with all those things that we've mentioned... And realizing the fact that sin exists, we understand something. The Christian life is hard. It's never been promised in Scripture that the Christian life would be easy. Matter of fact, we learn that living the Christian life is a life that means people are going to oppose us. That's never easy to handle. It means sin well, it's not going to be exempt from us. We're going to have to deal with the effects of sin. We're going to have to deal with temptations that come in life. And that means something as children of God, as Christians, as people who live after Christ. I need strength. Not just to live through the everyday things that exist, but I need strength to understand that I don't have to live under the bondage of sin. Sin exists. And we need strength. The scripture reading this morning comes from Ephesians chapter 6. Go ahead and turn your Bibles there. The majority of our lesson this morning will be taken from Ephesians chapter 6. Because in the midst of Ephesians chapter 6, we learn something about the strength of the Christian. We're going to do so in three different ways to see how we can have strength. And at the end of the lesson, we need to ask ourselves a question. Where does our strength come from? First, we need to talk about strength. What does it mean to have strength? What is strength and what is it to the Christian? Number two, we need to look at something called protection. Our world is filled with the concept of sin. How, how do we protect ourselves from sin? How do I stand against, in strength, temptation? Then we're going to look at what I call mental might. There's an aspect of everything we're going to be talking about this morning that has to do with us personally. And it has to do with our mental might. I want to ask you a question right now. We're going to ask it somewhere near the end. Have you decided to live as a Christian should live? Have you decided to live as a Christian should live? Have you made the declaration in your mind, I will be a child of God forever? When life gets hard, I will be a child of God. When life is easy, oh, it's easy to say that, isn't it? I will be a child of God. In the midst of a world filled with sin, in the midst of a world filled with problems, 
the Christian stands. And the Christian has to be the type of person that can stand up to the things that are in this world and survive. And thus, the strength of the Christian is our conversation this morning. Let's begin just by talking about the word strength. You know, when you start to think about life, you begin to think about the circumstances that exist in the midst of life. And when you get into the book of Ephesians, if you look at Ephesians chapter 1, verses, or chapter 1 all the way through chapter 3, there's a letter being written to people who are children of God, and it's a letter that is encouraging people and intends to show people through chapters 1 through 3 that God desires us to live a certain way. That we should be people who desire to live after God. That's what we call the circumstances of life. We should be the type of people, chapters 1 through 3, that live as the child of God would live. I know you know this this morning, but it would be impossible for us in the short time that we have together to go through every chapter and every verse in the book of Ephesians. But understand when you read chapters 1 through 3, God is calling us, Paul here is motivating us to live as God would have us to live. Then when you move through chapter 1 through 3 into chapters 4 through 6, there's a different scenario that's happening. In this particular section, God is trying to, or He's trying to show us that God has a standard for us to live by. God has a standard for us to live by. Here's why we call this the circumstances of life. Life is different. In every occasion of life, it's different. You may go out today and never have a problem. You may leave from this building this morning and you may run into every problem that life could give you. The circumstances of life exist in one scenario. Am I going to live as a child of God? Or am I not? Now, I know that sounds rather easy to say, and it is. It's a real easy question to ask. Am I going to live as God would have me to live? That's an easy question. It's a hard question, however, to answer. Because life sometimes is unpredictable. And when we start to talk about Christian strength, sometimes we look at Christian strength the same. And we think about Christian strength as something that's unpredictable, as something we only need during times of troubles and trials and sorrows. But it's not. Christian strength is something that we need when things are great. Christian strength is something we need when things are just fine. Christian strength is something that we need when things are terrible. Throughout all the circumstances of life, we are a people who need strength. And that's why you find at the end of this particular section in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 20, a section that talks about strength. Look at verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. We have to understand, sin exists in all circumstances of life. That brings us on to a thought. We are a people that need to have true Strength. You know, when we think about strength, there's two ways we can think about it. Number one, we can think about strength that is physical strength. And we can think about who can lift this object or who can lift this much weight and who can lift it this many of times. And you can even look throughout our world and there are competitions in our world to see who is the strongest man in the world. They're strong. There are people that have some great physical might. There are people that can lift things that to our minds should not be lifted by mere man. But they've put the time into that physical strength to train themselves, to condition themselves, to be able to pick up whatever object it is. The same thing is true with spiritual strength. You know, we're not talking about physical strength this morning. I'm not going to be asking anyone to come up here and pick this podium up by themselves. I'm not going to ask anyone what the greatest weight you can lift this morning. But I'm going to ask you a question. What is your spiritual strength? 
as we face the world that we live in, how strong are you spiritually? To look at this, I want you to look at Ephesians chapter 6 and go back to verse 10 again. And I want us to center in on some things that are happening here. Look at the very first word of Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Finally. This is a transitional term that's being used here that identifies the source of the strength. He says, finally, brethren, be strong in what? The world? That's not what he says. Finally, brethren, be strong in your body. That's not what he says. Finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. This is a transitional statement that concludes him from everything he's been talking about in chapters 1 through 3, in chapters 4 through 6. He's bringing all of this down to a note. He's bringing it all down to a head. In 10 short verses, he's going to show you here is where strength lies. Here is how you get to keep your strength. Here's how you survive the world, the life that you live, all of the circumstances that are going to come unto you. I want you to look at some other things that happen in this particular section. He says, finally, my brethren, be strong. I want you to center in on this particular word. This word is very impressive when you look at it in the way it was originally written. This is a word that means be empowered. Finally, brethren, be empowered. It's also a word that means endued with strength. Finally, brethren, have all the strength that you need to fight the spiritual warfare that we fight. But you know, that's not the interesting part about this particular word. Uh, This word gets a little bit deeper when you look into the way that it's being used. And throughout our lesson this morning, there are a couple of different words, really I think three words we're going to look at, that are going to show us a little bit deeper meaning of this particular passage. Here's the first one, this word, be strong. This particular word is a word that's present, passive, imperative. Now that doesn't mean a lot to us because, well, that's complicated. But when you look at Greek words, when you look at words the way they're used, it's kind of like English words. We have different ways we use words, and we have different forms words. The same thing with this language that we're looking at here this morning. This word or this phrase, be strong, it's it's one word. It means be empowered. Have everything you need to survive, but there's something that's happening in the midst of this word that tells us about this strength, that tells us about this empowerment that he's talking about here. It means it's a present imperative or a present passive imperative word. The word present here means It's a statement of fact. Be strong. It's a fact. You have to be strong if you're going to live as a child of God. It's present in its word. It's passive. That's the voice that it's being used in. In other words, the word when it was written in its original language, when they saw this word and they saw the construct on the end of the word, they would have saw this word as a word that means this is something that I need. I need strength. At the end of all of this letter, this is what he's saying. You who are reading this, you need strength. Finally, brethren, be strong. We have to have it. It's a statement of fact. It's something that we need. And it's a word that's imperative. Now, the imperative form of the word means that this is something something that's going to be performed. The imperative form of a word is something that's going to be performed. So listen to this. Finally, brethren, be strong. It's a statement of fact. We have to be, as children of God, strong. Finally, brethren, be strong. It's passive. We need this. It's not just something that is a fact that I need. It's something that I know I have to have. And then in third place, it's imperative. It's something I have to do. There's going to be something that's going to be involved in this idea of strength here that means I've got to get up and do something. It's the same thing for people who lift physical strength. Why, you see, they didn't just go lift that car by accident. They did so in that great physical might because they trained themselves, they conditioned themselves, and they worked to be strong. The same thing is true for you and me, people. The same thing is true, brethren. If we want to be strong, I must understand that there's something I have to do. God means something to us. I sure hope He does to you. And I hope when you read this particular passage, you understand with the the phrase, be strong, 
I have to have this. But I want you to see the rest of the verse. Be strong because I need it as a statement of fact. Be strong because it's something that I have to have. Be strong because it's a certain action that I need to be performing. Be strong in the Lord. Be strong in the power of His might. I want to tell you this morning, strength, spiritual strength, why it's something that God provides. And it's not something that we do on our own. Let's move in the second place over to protection. And we're moving into a question, what do we do? You know, we need strength. Sin exists, we know that for a fact. Our world is increasingly changing. But what do we do? He's already told me in verse 10, this is something I need, the strength, I have to have it. It's imperative for me that I have this strength. But what do I do about it? Read verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand the wiles of the devil. If you look at the word put on, it's also in the original language one word. And this is a fascinating word. We, we pass by this particular phrase quite often. And, and until this study, I had passed by this word and I never knew. I never knew that there was so much more. What do I need to do to be a faithful Christian? I need to put on the whole armor of God. What do I need to survive when things are great, when things are good? I need to put on the whole armor of God. What do I need to do to go to heaven in eternity? I need to put on the whole armor of God. But I want to increase your view of this particular phrase that's put on in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11. Uh, this is a word, and I know these are words that we don't use very often, uh, but this is a word that's aorist, middle, and it's imperative. It's the structure of the word again, just like the phrase, be strong. But when you look at the phrase, put on, we need to see some things. It's aorist, and that means it has no regard for past, for present, or for future. This is something that I need to do no matter what aspect of life I'm in. Whether it's something that I've done in my past, whether it's something I'm doing right now in the present, or if it's something I'm going to have to do in my future, I need to understand that I have to put on at all times of my life the armor of God. And here's the reasoning with this particular word. Because I cannot do it by myself. He says, put on in the aorist form. It's, middle, it's a middle word. It's aorist middle. And that means it's something that I'm going to be doing. It indicates the action of someone actually, when they read this, put on, someone who is putting on that armor. You see in the screen before you, the image right there above the word protection of a man who is standing there and you can see the armor upon his arms. You can see the breastplate that's there and you can see the sword that's in his hand. When a man went to battle, he had to put on his armor. Why? Because he needed protection. Ladies and gentlemen, when we walk out of these doors this morning, this is a safe place. This is a place where temptation should not be taking us. This is a place where we should be focusing more than any other place in the world upon God. It's a place where our minds should not wander. But when we walk out of these doors, and there are four of them in this room, when we walk out of these doors, the world's there. And we better have our armor on. This is a word that's aorist, it's middle, and it's imperative. It's the same as above. It's kind of like the word imperative that we use. We say that it's imperative that this gets done. It's something we have to do. We're asking the question, what do we do? You put on the armor of God every day. We are, we are God's people. And God's people are a prepared people because Ephesians chapter 6 verse 10 says we stand in the power of His might. I want you to understand that we're not putting on a physical armor. We could go right now and each one of us could buy armor and we could put it on. They make nice, new, fancy armor that's made to stop bullets. We could get that type of honor or armor this day. But this is not the armor we're looking at. We need protection for when we go out into the world because sin, it exists. And we are God's people. We're different. 
Now look at the rest of this particular section. Here's what he says in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 14 and the following. If you look at verse 14, he says this, Stand therefore. There's something that's interesting in that particular section. And it may be the most impressive section that I've found in this particular area of Scripture. Stand is a word that is second, aorist, active, imperative. And what that means, that's a fancy word of, or fancy way of saying, this is something you don't need to miss. This is something that's not going to be said very often. The one who is putting on the armor of God, he will always stand. He will never be in a position where he will not stand. So I want to tell you something. We ask the question, what do we do in spiritual war? What do we do when sin creeps in? What do I do when temptation exists? I need to make sure before it does exist that I've put on the armor of God. When you got up this morning, did you put on your armor? When you get up tomorrow morning, are you going to put it on? If you realize midway through the day that you didn't put it on this morning, remember this is, this is a phrase, the word put on, remember? It, was, it, it had a disregard for past, present, and future. You need to put this on at all times. Put it on. When you go to work, have you put on your armor? I'm blessed in the work that I do because I get to be here at this building. And I don't have to deal anymore with the things that come in from the world because this is a good environment. But you know if when you go to work, there are people there who aren't living after the Christ. There are people there who have no regard for who God is. There are people there who have no concept of what truth is. And that means something to you and me. It means there are people in our world that have a disregard for eternity. A disregard for this book. When they read stand, when they read put on, they don't care. Now, I don't say that to be disrespectful toward anyone that lives in this world. But ladies and gentlemen, we are children of God. We're different. And every morning when you get up, you put on that armor. Let's talk about that armor for just a minute. As you go through this particular section all the way down to verse 17, you're going to learn as you look at verse 13 or verse 14, stand therefore having your loins girded about with truth. The girdle was awfully or often highly decorative. It was very elaborate. And it was a place where they carried their money. It was a place where they could sheath their sword. It was a place where everything that they had that they needed to carry with them into battle, they would put it. If it was important, it was protected here. The girdle seems to be sometimes a cincture of iron and steel. It was very strong. It was designed to keep every other part of the armor in place. Now listen to what God's telling us here. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand the wiles of the devil. Stand therefore, having your learns girt about with all truth. Why does he say, gird up your loins with all truth? Because truth is that which holds everything else together. Just like the one who was preparing to go into battle and he put on his girdle. It was that which everything else was attached to. Everything that he needed in war depended on this section. He also tells us as we keep on going through here that we're going to put on the breastplate. Look at verse 14, middle of the verse, and having the breastplate of righteousness, I, I need to protect my core. Same thing when one goes into battle. This is a very crucial area. All of the issues, all of the elements that happen in the midst of this body happen here. You know, in battle, we don't like to think about these terms, but sometimes an arm may be lost or a limb may be lost. But if the core is lost... There is no life. Now I want you to understand this. That which we are protecting is our lives. And we're connecting the girdle with the breastplate. All of this is connected together. We're going to put on the breastplate of righteousness which is connected to truth. You keep on going in the midst of this. He says in verse 15, 
and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Preparation of the gospel. Did you prepare this morning for worship? It's a perpetual thing that we do. Tomorrow morning, we're going to get up and we're going to assemble back into the workforce. Have you prepared yourself for that? You keep on going down through this particular section in verse 16. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked. I take my shield because I need protection. The shield of faith is extra protection. He also says in verse 17, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. I want you to notice something. This is crucial. When we begin in verse 14, and when we end here in verse 17, we begin with truth, we end with truth. We began with truth, we end with truth. Do you want to know what your protection is in this life? It's truth. And here in this particular section, he says, stand. Take a stand and do not move. And thus you can have the protection that you need. But you know, that's not all. We need to think about our mental might. I, I want you to go all the way back to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12 as we begin to, to ring our thoughts together. And I want you to look at the very first word. For. For. The power of God is necessary because we cannot do this on our own. You cannot stand as an individual outside of God, away from God, and against God and expect to stand against sin. Remember the, the armor that he says put on your whole armor or put on the whole armor of God? It begins with truth, it ends with truth. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to understand that this is why I said this in the beginning. It's why I'm going to say it again. Sin exists. We could spend the rest of the day talking about all the different types of sin and probably do as many would do in the New Testament days and continue on to midnight talking about things that are sinful. And we're not going to do that. But we need to understand sin exists. It exists in the home if we let it in. It exists in our marriages if we bring it in. It exists in our families when we're not paying attention. And I want to say this, it can exist in the middle of the church when we don't tolerate or when we take a stand against truth. He says, stand therefore with your loins girt about with truth. He ends in the section, you take truth, which is the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit. He begins with truth, he ends with truth. The word for in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12 tells us an important story. Look at it back at verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand the wiles of the devil. For. Here's something we need to understand. Sin does not just exist in the very few areas of life. It exists in every area of life when we do not have our armor on. Let's look at our last thing, and it happens here in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. Our mental might is personal. We have to decide as we are sitting here this morning that we're going to be people that stand for God. This country, this nation, this community that we live in depends on you, and it depends on me. Because we have to be the type of people who are willing to take a stand. Look at verse 12 again. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. The concept we're talking about here of needing strength for is in every occasion of life. And that's why I submit to you this morning, this is personal. That's why I mentioned the family. That's why I mentioned our marriages. Men, I want to tell you something. And this is something that has to hit me first before I say it. If we're not going to protect our families from sin, who is? 
Men, it is your responsibility to stand up for your family. And you better quit it and stand up and do it right. Sin exists and it happens in the family. Marriages, there are two people in a marriage and both people have to stand up for what is right. People who exist in the Lord's body. You want to know how you take a stand? You want to know why this is personal? If we're going to exist in the midst of the Lord's church, and I promise you, hear me what I'm saying here. This hits me first. If we're going to be people who are calling themselves the people of God, we have to live right. Temptation hits me too. We all have things we struggle with. The world is watching to see what we do. And that's why he says, verse 14, Stand therefore with all the protection that God can give you. Stand with everything that you have. And if you bring it all the way back up to verse 11, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand the wiles of the devil. I don't have to live in sin. I don't have to live under the bondage of sin. If you take it back up to verse 10, and this is the best part of this lesson this morning, if you take this all the way back up to verse 10, here's what we see. Finally, my brethren, listen to what he says. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of of His might. Where does all this power come from? I submit to you this morning, matter of fact, I assert to you this morning that it does not come from mankind. Verse 10 is a passage that teaches us that we cannot do this on our own and we are dependent upon the power and the might of God. Sin exists. Whether you talk about the sins that exist in our world, sins like abortion, things like the new movement sweeping across this nation of the LGBTQ community, whether we're talking about whether we accept sin or not, whether we're talking about little things and they're not really little things, whether we're talking about lying or cheating or stealing or gossip, we don't like to talk about gossip, do we? Whether we're talking about things in the midst of the family or the home or we're talking about things that happen in the midst of the church, sin has a possibility to be there. And this is what we have to do. We have to stand. We have to stand with God. We have to put on. We have to put on the armor that God provides. And remember, it begins with truth. It ends with truth. Never stray away from the words of God because God's not willing to stray away from you. And then we have to remember this. I have to keep putting it on. I may have to do it every day. I may have to put it on a couple of times a day. But I have to remember that if I'm going to have the strength of the Christian, I'm going to put on the armor that God gives me. Because what we have to face this morning is what's found in Romans chapter 3, verse 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We don't have to live like that. I can be a person who has strength. I can be a person that knows this morning before I walk out of these doors that I'm marching toward eternity with God's people. Two more things we need to discuss. Do you want to be God's people this morning? I hope this morning that as you're sitting here you realize that you are either on God's side or you are not. You have either put on His armor or you have not. Scripture is very plain. If I'm going to be a person of God, if I'm going to be a Christ-like person, if I'm going to be a righteous person, if I'm going to be a holy person, if I'm going to be acceptable unto God, I'm going to put on Christ as well. By hearing His Word, by believing that He is who He says He is, that He is more than what we can comprehend, that I'm willing to repent of my sins because, ladies and gentlemen, we must face it. Sin exists. It affects us, and it's going to for eternity, and we have to be willing to fight it. 
Repent of my sins. The word repent is a scary word, but it's so simple. Change. If you lie, lie no more. If you steal, steal no more. Oh, it's a simple concept. It is hard to apply because we have to apply it to ourselves. Repent of your sins. Confess the name of Jesus, the sweetest words that you'll ever say in your life, and then be immersed in water. And I can assure you this morning that behind me in front of you is enough water for you to go down into the watery grape of baptism and to come back up, resurrected a new creature, a new man, in a new life, and be willing to put on the armor of God. You can become a child of God this morning. I'm going to say this out of all respect. I'm going to say this out of all respect, and, and, and hear me, I, I'm not saying this to disrespect anyone. But there are people here this morning that are not children of God. Whatever has happened in your life, whatever is stopping you from becoming a child of God, let go of that this morning. Put on the armor of God. Stand as a child of God. And no, you don't have to live like this anymore. All the fear, the guilt, the worries, and the tears can go away if you're willing to become a child of God. Here's the second thing. It may be the case that you could be just like I am this morning, a child of God. Sometimes it's hard to put on your armor because we forget sometimes. Sometimes we don't want to put it on. Sometimes we're selfish and we only put on parts of it. And that leads to disaster. Any one of us could have sin in our lives this morning. But the best part about the gospel is that God just doesn't put us out on the steps. He doesn't whip us with a newspaper. He doesn't put us out for eternity. Instead, He stands looking afar, waiting for us to come home. Waiting for us to put that armor back on so that we can continue to be His child and He can continue to be our Heavenly Father and so that we can go into eternity together. There may be sin in your life. I encourage you this morning, look at your life. I'm going to have to do it when you do. Look at your life. If you have a need to respond this morning, whether becoming a child of God or needing to put your armor back on, Thank you.